everyone. Good morning. I'm so happy to be here. This is a very special day. Um, I think I haven't been this happy and my heart has been that happy in like a while. And um, I'm super happy because this very special person emailed uh, all of the CP solvers like maybe a week or a week and a half ago. Um, she had a very special request uh, that I think echoed uh, what everyone was feeling. Uh, she wanted to commemorate, was um, well, not commemorate, but really dedicate a space to our Ukrainian uh, friends and family and really join together in a lot of the, join together in like feeling and what, and everything that's happening in the world. Um, there's a lot of good things happening. There's a lot of bad things happening. And I know it's very hard for all of us to really, um, you know, feel close to one another in these hard times. And she actually found a way to join us all together in this very special place for a very special occasion. And that person is Sukriti. <laughs> so Sukriti, uh, thank you so much for all of the work that you put on in, in this. Um, I'll let you explain more of what's happening today, but I just, I'm so grateful to have you in my life and to be a part of today. So go ahead. <laughs> Thank you, Maria. I think um, that's really very kind. But um, I think when we when we began to put this together and you know think about how we could help um, every CP Solver member, and then when we opened it up to the public, um, other people from the medical community just immediately jumped up to help and you know contribute in uh, whichever way they could. And I think that has been. Um, just a testament to how strong this community is and um, both within the CP solvers and as a community of medical professionals um, as a whole. And I'm so glad I don't want to um, talk about what's happening. We're all aware of, uh, you know, the, the happenings in Ukraine and um, really all parts of the world, but we hope that we can do a little bit to, um, I guess, to be up and in our own selfish way, be a part of something bigger than ourselves and um, um, do something, give back to our community that's given us so much. So thank you so much for being here. We're very, very excited for this session. Um, we're gonna start off with an RLR and a case presented by the incredible Jack. And I think it'll be, um, really an adventure from here on out. We have Aaron, we have Charmaine and Jack, and then we have Stefan Zavin, and we have an all-star lineup of um, case presenters as well. So, you know, feel free to jump in the chat and discuss and um, we can all nerd out. Maybe if um, Charmaine, would you like to share a few thoughts? I'll definitely share a lot more a little later. But incredibly grateful for you, Sakriti, for you, Maria, for every single CP Solvers team member and our wonderful community. Thank you for always being there in little ways and big ways. We appreciate you. And I can't wait for today. And if you have the ability to donate, please do. If you don't, just being here, it's plenty. All right, RG. Hello, hello. Um, uh, one, I think it's a treat to be here it's an honor and privilege and i think um it really is down to the entire cp solvers team members um, with the spotlight um, predominantly for a few seconds being on the people we just heard about i also saw that somebody just joined laura um, uh, we wouldn't be able to plug this event as uh, prominently without you and as effectively without you so thank you um, as a disclosure this is my lame attempt to wear um, blue and yellow it's the only blue and yellow i have um, and I, I just wanted to acknowledge one thing. Um, I, I just to layer on to um, uh, layer on to the conversations of people. Obviously, all of us are aligned in our opinions here to layer on to everything else. Is something that when I told my mom um, what, what we were doing, she's like, "Huh? Why this?" She said that. She said, "Why this?" I know my mom, and I love my mom. Um, she's one of the most thoughtful people I met. She used to work as a nurse in a hospital and loves alleviating suffering. It's her. It's a joy um that gives her life and she said why this and what about everything that you have been through personally as somebody who's been in a bathroom 
while they've been bombing outside my house in Lebanon, with which actually has um, shrapnel and bullet holes in it still to this day. Why this? And um, my answer in my re reflex response were, well, it has to start somewhere. And we started talking about George Floyd, how I knew nothing about systemic racism and was so completely ignorant to problems of that nature beforehand. Not completely ignorant, not zero, but definitely not, definitely not a pass. Definitely not a pass, maybe still not a pass, but definitely closer to a pass now. And it has to start somewhere. Um, the spotlight is on Ukraine today because um, what is happening in Ukraine is absolutely devastating. And it is a crisis of epic proportions. Um, and the what about phenomenon is also interesting. What about Yemen? What about Lebanon? What about hundreds of places? And my answer is, for me, it's got to start somewhere and it's starting here today. It won't end here. It won't end at 10 o'clock PST or seven o'clock or whatever. It won't end here. It begins here today. And I hope um, you have a little bit of faith in that by studying what um, our WDX team has done by starting somewhere with women in diagnosis, by what our anti-racism team has done um, after the events of George Floyd, by reflecting on what um, the entire crew of CP Solvers team members has done with regards to advocating for IMGs in the United States. We all started somewhere, right? Mm -hmm. We weren't born doing any of those things. And so hopefully this is the beginning of a journey that spreads the message of alleviating suffering beyond diagnostic reasoning. We don't just diagnose patients, we treat them and we treat their illnesses and the context in which they are suffering. And this is that today. So um, I hope uh, you started a long time ago and I hope you are way more aware and wise than I, but I'm starting today. Well, actually it started like probably a couple of weeks ago. Um, and thank you for, for joining. I'll pass the mic to Prof. Rez. Thank you all so much for those thoughtful reflections. And I too want to applaud Sukriti and Maria to leading this in initiative. And I want everyone to click on that link that Anne-Marie Comfort has shared, AMK, and make a contribution. Take out your credit card. Don't worry, my number's not on this for all you YouTubers who are going to try to steal my identity. I don't think my number was on that, but if it was, we can edit it out. Um, and I'm so proud to be here. And I don't want to take up too much time, but my reflection is that every time I turn on the news, it seems like a nightmare is unfolding in Ukraine because of the war crimes of Putin and his government. So I think it's um, really important that uh, we show our support, that we stand with the Ukrainians, and I hope we can show them more support. And on my Twitter, I pinned a tweet, which was of Arnold Schwarzenegger, you know, addressing um, this issue. And it's really an inspirational video. And um, I'll conclude with what he said at the end of that video, which is the Russian people who are protesting and risking 15 years in jail or in prison are his new heroes. So this is not a war that Russia wanted. This is a war that Putin and the government of Russia wanted. And now we stand against them. And at the end of the day, our Russian brothers and sisters, they have 10 million family that live in Ukraine. So every bullet that flies into Ukraine is killing one of their brothers and sisters. So it's not the Russian people, it's the Russian government. And this is our small way of helping them. So please, contribute even if it's a dollar and help us reach that goal. We'll be tracking the contributions and it doesn't matter when you make that contribution, but I'd love to say that Ravi and I inspire uh, several hundreds of dollars by the end of our session. Thank you so much. Hey, P. All right, I'm happy to get us started. I wanted to share one thing. I shared this with Sukriti this morning. Um, but I think just to sort of, I think one of the things that has really struck me both about this session today and also for those of you who were here on VMR um, uh, towards the very beginning on Juneteenth, 2020, when um, Dr. Manning brought, brought her dad, Mr. Mr. Draper on to the CP Solvers to give a session on that. I think one of the things that was so striking about that session was just how close things that feel really long ago um, uh, 
actually are. You know, I think hearing hearing Dr. Manning's dad talk about the Jim Crow South, um, which were things that he lived through, not even when he was necessarily a child, but well into his sort of adolescence and into a, adulthood, talking about going 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 to work with his dad and seeing his dad sort of have to have have to yield to racism in the workplace. I think it really brought home how these things that feel like a long time ago really aren't that long ago. And my brother sent me something this morning that I think also drove that message home that I'm going to share here. Um, you all can, I think, see this now. This is actually a petition for naturalization for my great grandpa, um, uh, Harry Mazaroff. Um, and you can see here, he came to the United States from Kyiv, Russia. This is when Kyiv was still a part of Russia back in 1911, which feels like a really long time ago, right? This was before World War I. This was before the Titanic sailed. Um, and also this is somebody who um, was the father of this gentleman here, Uncle Nate, who when I was eight years old, I like listened to Nate tell stories about boxing, boxing in Detroit. And I think the fact that like these things that feel so long ago are actually really, really close um, reminds me that the things that feel like they're going to happen a long time from now probably aren't that far away. And the things that we do today can hopefully help make a difference for that. And um, I'm just incredibly grateful to Sukriti and Maria for the work that they have done to put this forward. And I'm incredibly grateful for everybody who's here um, uh, for, um, you know, supporting this cause. So I think exactly as Robbie said, so eloquently and so perfectly, like the, these, these things, even though they may feel small and even though they may feel like starting points, I think they do ultimately matter and build momentum for hopefully things to be, to be, to be better in the future. Um, so I just want to say thanks everybody. And we can get started with the case now. All right. So our journey starts today um, with something that, um, uh, uh, with uh, a chief concern that is, um, uh, I think, hopefully going to be a rich one to start with. And this is um, uh, going to be a 73-year-old gentleman who is presenting to the hospital with weeks of progressive hoarseness. So he um, has a history of underlying COPD that has been sort of stable over many, many years. Um, in the setting of his COPD, he has a chronic cough that has maybe worsened slightly over the last three to six weeks, um, sort of alongside the time course that his hoarseness has developed. Um, and then he also kind of has some general systemic symptoms of sort of fatigue, malaise, but no fevers, no night sweats, no weight loss, just to sort of generally not been feeling right. But really it was um, his wife who noticed that his voice was a lot different um, uh, and was sort of like, what's going on? Like, uh, you should go and see your doctor about this. Um, and so he ended up presenting to the hospital um, uh, with, with these, yeah, with these overall symptoms. I think it's worth noting that he has no dysphagia, no odynophagia. He's been able to eat and drink normally. Um, but the, the sort of prim primary complaint has been some of these systemic symptoms of just sort of generally not feeling right. Um, and then also these sort of changes in his voice. Oh, what a start. You know, it's incredible that um, Jack is sharing this case with us. And I, I don't know the case, but I feel like it, it probably was on his radar recently because he just published an outstanding schema to hoarseness that I had the chance to look at very closely. So I'm at a tremendous advantage that I would have been without Jack's help um, in removing this case. And for me, um, uh, I will share with you uh, not, not necessarily an approach to hoarseness, which I'll pass the mic to Prof Rez to help me do, but to try to anchor it in something, try to anchor it in a context. And that context is what's neurologic, but isn't neurologic. I presented a case to Reza of a man who fell, tripped mechanically, and then couldn't get up afterwards and was profoundly weak. And he wasn't weak because he damaged a muscle, nerve, plexus, um, cord, or brain. He was weak because he tore a ligament. Weakness is either a neurological issue is either an orthopedic issue, is either actually ischemia to the limb, which can happen. Um, that's the uh, paralysis part of the five Ps of acute limb ischemia. Or finally, it can be asthenia, not weakness at all. So when you hear the words weak, your instinct is gonna be neurologic, but remember you might need a orthopedic surgery. You might need to revascularize an artery that's clogged, or you might have a non-acute um, issue that would fall under the category of asthenia. So neuro, ortho, vascular surgery, or take your time, not emergent. 
What does hoarseness have to do with weakness? The same approach exists to hoarseness, except the orthopedic apparatus is now no longer an orthopedic issue, but an ENT issue. So the simple approach to hoarseness is to say, is there something wrong with the tendons required to move in a, in a musical manner to generate a smooth non-hoarse voice, or is there a neurological lesion? The big challenge here is unlike the knee, I can't see those tendons. So I need to rely on my colleagues to do so. So that's the key question here. Do we need an ENT doctor or do we need a neurologist? But who cares? Prof Rez is here. <laughs> it was so funny. Um, Jack, as you were presenting this case, Robbie texted me, you go first. And I said, no, Robbie, it's your turn to go first. And of course, Ravi is one of the most stubborn people I know. He talked about an orthopedic problem to allow me to share the schema <laughs> to the hoarseness. I don't think there's a more kind uh, partner you can have during one of these unknown discussions. And I feel really weird doing this because it happens that the presenter knows more about hoarseness than I do. So what I am going to do is I'm actually going to share with all of you what I'm looking at. And I think I want to show you the, the roadmap. Uh, don't get bogged down in the details just yet. At the start of any case, I want everyone to ignore the anatomic causes for right now, because we have to really prioritize the most common etiologies. And I think what Robbie does so well is he uses analogic reasoning, because I would love to know in the audience, how many of you have actually thought about hoarseness at a serious level? Probably not many, but you've thought about headache, you've thought about back pain. And so what Jack did with this beautiful schema is he's like, what are the red flags as you would for back pain, whether it's weight loss, fever, history of cancer, or for headache. Um, and he applied the same type of reasoning strategy to hoarseness. And so right now we're seeking for any red flags and we don't really have many yet. Maybe the, the tempo is a red flag, but there's no dysphagia, there's no dinophagia. So then we come to step two, which is the common causes of horse, hoarseness. As I'm doing this, what I'm really taking you on is a diagnostic thought train, which um, Kara helped bring to CP solvers. And in this diagnostic thought train, it would say, look for red flags. If there aren't any, then just come to the common etiologies. Is this person a singer? Have they been speaking a lot? Have they been shouting? I'm sure all of you have experienced hoarseness after a night of um, speaking a lot. Have they been drinking alcohol? Have they been smoking? These are common causes. Is there any rhinorrhea or conjunctivitis to suggest a URI? So I will leave it at that, but this is the roadmap we're going. But if in the next aliquot, we get more information or the physical exam, then we can go to Jack's uh, more complex approach, which is what Robbie was breaking down for you. Brain, spinal cord, recurrent laryngeal nerve, neuromuscular junction, and then the laryngeal apparatus. Robbie, do you like that term, laryngeal apparatus? It makes me sound much smarter than I am. <laughs> no, I think, I think it's on point, my friend. All right, so I'll give you some more sort of background information. So in terms of other past medical history, um, has sort of the common, the, uh, common problems that, any 73 -year -old, that many 73-year-old gentlemen have, yes, some, some hef pef, some hypertension, some hyperlipidemia, some type 2 diabetes. In terms of the medications he takes, he is on a inhaled corticosteroid at home, long-standing use, as well as a um, uh, long-acting muscarinic antagonist. He takes lisinopril for his hypertension, metformin for his diabetes, atorvastatin for his hyperlipidemia. Um, in terms of his family history, it was uh, unremarkable. Uh, in terms of social history, he was um, uh, originally born in, uh, uh, in China, lived there for numerous years, immigrated to the United States 
about 25 years ago, but has um, uh, uh, goes back uh, with with relatively high frequency. Um, it has obviously been limited in the last couple of years, but he did travel there um, uh, over the over the holidays, so like within the last three to six months. In terms of health related behaviors, has about a 60 pack year tobacco use history. Drinks alcohol maybe like four to five drinks a week, sort of occasionally with dinner. No known drug allergies. In terms of his exam, he was afebrile, had stable vital signs. Uh, on exam, he was not in any acute distress. He was able to manage his secretions well. On cervical exam, he had like some shoddy cervical lymphadenopathy, but nothing that was particularly large or particularly firm. His cardiac exam was normal. Pulmonary exam, he had um, uh, left greater than right crackles, predominantly in the upper lobes bilaterally. Abdominal exam was benign. Neurologic exam was normal. Extremity exam was normal. And then um, uh, our ENT colleagues very generously came down uh, to evaluate the patient and did a bedside laryngoscopy in the emergency room. Um, and what they noted is that the actual vocal cords themselves, there was no overt lesions on the surface of the vocal cords. They looked normal, but the left vocal cord um, uh, did not abduct normally when he spoke. So it looked like there was paralysis of the left vocal cord on bedside laryngoscopy. And we'll stop there. Jack, the shark penner. He's, he's putting up the bait, Robbie, for us to, to tackle. I will uh, cover the background data and leave the, the physical exam for Robbie to comment on. And I think when you look at this background data, a few things pop out immediately. One is the fact that the patient's on lisinopril. We know lisinopril is an ACE inhibitor. You can get a buildup of bradykinin. This can lead to a cough, one of the most common causes of cough. However, um, lisinopril should not cause hoarseness. I mean, you could think if the cough was so severe that maybe someone would be hoarse, but I would be very cautious with linking hoarseness to lisinopril, like I would link cough or angioedema to lisinopril. Then you get additional data that he is a long time smoker. That obviously prioritizes or makes us consider some form of malignancy. And if you wanna link malignancy to hoarseness, probably the easiest way to do that is some kind of oral pharyngeal malignancy where it involves the laryngeal apparatus. The, the fact that he was born um, in China, that really doesn't affect my clinical reasoning just yet. The truth is a third of the world's population has been exposed to tuberculosis. And yes, TB can have a myriad of manifestations, including upper respiratory, which can lead to hoarseness and cough, but it would be a mistake to use that as a point to prioritize that specific diagnosis at this juncture in the case with this data that Jack has presented. So before I pass the mic to Robbie, we have a 73-year-old gentleman with one red flag for hoarseness being the duration with a background of lisinopril and strong smoking history who now I will uh, give the mic to Robbie to comment on further. All right, I love that PR. Absolutely love that PR. And I think that the exam is really helpful here because if you're looking and going back to that simple approach of is it neurologic or is it ENT, I think the question has been answered. Of course, no test is perfect, but ENT's best guess is they couldn't find anything that is in the local area to explain hoarseness. And so you move by default to the, to the neurologic apparatus. And here, there's a profound clue. The profound clue isn't what is positive. It is what is glaringly negative. There is nothing else going on in this patient except a left-sided vocal cord issue. 
the focality of that is profound. There's no CNS symptoms. There's no cord symptoms. There's no muscle symptoms. And so the, the pertinent negatives here are so profoundly important and localize the issue to well, ask the simple question, what only affects the left vocal cord? And the answer to that is a fascinating um, anatomic peculiarity. So um, unlike Prof Rez, who is perfectly symmetrical, look at him, look at the perfect symmetry, eyebrows, nose, teeth, there's perfect symmetry. The truth is the, on, on the inside, even Prof Rez is asymmetric. And what happens with Prof Rez's uh, laryngeal nerves, unless he has situs inversus, which I, um, I would know, um, and maybe he wouldn't know, um, the left recurrent laryngeal nerve takes a long course all the way down under his aorta into his mediastinum and back up. <laughs> it's not just his left recurrent, <laughs> recurrent laryngeal nerve, it's all of you, unless you have situs inversus. Why? Um, it is an anatomic pure, uh, peculiarity that relates to the separation of the neck and the chest as we grow. So um, the, what is different about the left versus the right here? The, the left, the recurrent laryngeal nerve is injured most commonly in general as an idiopathic manner as a result of uh, neck surgery. So patients who get a, a thyroid dissection or parathyroid dissection get a laryngeal nerve neuropathy. The left side introduces a whole array of complexity because it courses through the mediastinum. And as a result, mediastinal disease, be it um, left atrial enlargement, mediastinal lymphadenopathy, enlarging of the aorta, so on and so forth. So here, the fact that this patient has not had prior neck surgery and has symptoms referable to the mediastinum with his cough, his crackles, tells us that those, this disease process localizes to the mediastinum and or the lungs. And so as we divide up our clinical reasoning journey into what is the problem and then what is the answer, we still don't know what the problem is. We just know that there is a problem in the mediastinum and no longer have to worry too much about the neck problem because now the problems in the mediastinum. So I'll rephrase and update Reza's problem representation by saying, this is a 73 year old man with a problem in his mediastinum. The clues to the nature of that problem are his background COPD, his travel history, and the fact that some of his problem appears to localize to the lungs. He also seems to have a systemic dimension to this problem by his nonspecific aesthetic symptoms. And we'll see what um, that turns out to be. All right, back to you, Dr. Penner. All right, I love it, I love it. So in terms of labs, had a white count of seven, a hemoglobin of 9.3, platelet count of 612, Looking back over his prior CBCs, we have the most recent one that we have is from about three years ago. Um, and at that time, his platelet count was normal. In terms of his metabolic panel, unremarkable. LFTs are normal. Chest X-ray showed basically some um, uh, left greater than right consolidated opacities in the upper lobes. A CT chest showed um, a like large left cavitary opacity, like a cavitary lesion in the left upper lobe. Some right-sided consolidate, um, right-sided apical nodular consolidations, with sort of consolidations in ground glass throughout the upper lobes bilaterally. Mediastinal lymphadenopathy. And then a CT neck was also obtained during this, uh, alongside the CT chest. And that showed nothing within the structures of the neck. But I will pull up an image here to show you because the CT neck also caught the base of the brain and the skull. And if I can just take over the screen for one second. That showed here, basically a solitary cystic lesion in the posterior fossa 
and the right posterior fossa. I know it's hard to see on the CT, but it's sort of, I'm trying to circle it here. So that was read as like around a two to three centimeter cystic lesion in the posterior fossa. Oh, all righty. Oh, very, very tricky. Um, you know, for old time's sake, I'll take a moment to reflect on um, the CBC and then pass the imaging to Prof Rez. And uh, the reason that is, is poor Prof Rez has heard me talk about thrombocytosis 10,000 times. And so we'll make it 10,001 today. And hopefully you'll match that um, number in the, in the dollars we raise. So um, what, is, what is thrombocytosis? Um, Thrombocytosis is fascinating. Um, and I'm skipping over the anemia because I, I argue that the answer to the thrombocytosis explains anemia. So thrombocytosis can either be a reaction to a systemic problem or a primary myeloproliferative neoplasm. Now the probability just on base rate of a myeloproliferative neoplasm with thrombocytosis is less than 10%, meaning that only 10% or less of people with platelet counts over 450 have a myeloid neoplasm-like essential thrombocytosis. Now that probability plummets when there is associated anemia. Why? Because in those patients, you expect a normal or high hemoglobin as part of that myeloproliferative process. So there are two reasons to know that this is actually reactive. One, is it developed in three years, which would be unusual for a myeloproliferative neoplasm. And two, there's an associated anemia. So um, what do platelets react to? Well, they react to the same things that cause inflammation, infections, cancers, and autoimmune diseases. Um, and as Rez has heard me many, many times before, it's actually not just any infection, any autoimmune disease, or any cancer. It's infections that hide, like abscesses or granulomatous diseases, and it's solid malignancies, overwhelmingly so. Lymphomas and leukemias don't cause a thrombocytosis. If they cause anything, they'll cause the opposite, a low platelet count. And autoimmune diseases is really cool because most of them are actually seronegative, meaning that the ANA and RF are negative. So there's predominantly vasculitic syndromes or inflammatory bowel disease. What's the signature here? The signature should be the focus on infection and malignancy, primarily driven by the Im imaging abnormalities, which I'll pass on to Reza to analyze. I think that's brilliant, Robbie. Um, and it's so fascinating, the power of the problem representation. And if you rewind this recording to maybe five minutes or 10 minutes ago, Robbie made a comment in discussing the physical exam. He said, there's two steps to solving a case. Identify the problem, identify the answer. In Aliquot 2 with the physical exam, we didn't know what the problem was. In Aliquot 3, we know what the problem is. In fact, you can remove all the data here, the HPI, the physical exam, the labs, and just focus on one, data point, and that's your PR, that's your why. And that's the cavitary lung lesion and the cystic lesion in the posterior fossa. That's what this case comes down to. So Ravi, are you smart? Let's get a slide, Ravi Shah. Yes, <laughs> Do you have to explain. Well, go back uh, 30, 40 episodes ago, and you guys will find out why I asked that. Um, now we're going to, Jack, we're going to break the pasta with this aliquot. And really what we mean by breaking the pasta is that the crux of this case is the cavitary lung lesions. What distinguishes a cavitary um, lung lesion versus an abscess versus a cystic lesion? This all has to do with the lining of said lesion. So the radiologist is interpreting what's happening in the posterior fossa as cystic, but how do we know that that's not gonna eventually cavitate? It's just based on the lining right now. And since we know cystic is usually more benign than cavitary, we have to focus on cavitary. So now we share our schema for cavitary lung lesion and maybe, um, Someone in the audience can include that CT solver schema as I highlight just the main points on that schema, because whatever is causing the cavitary lung lesion is causing the cystic lesion, is causing the hoarseness, is causing the thrombocytosis, is causing the anemia. And I think the differential on that white blood cell count, Jack, 
I'm sure it's not EOS NFLs because if it were, I imagine you would reveal that. So I'm going to assume it's not EOS uh normal white blood cell count. And it doesn't get better than this. I would uh, never do you like that, Reza. I would never <laughs> pull out the 3,000 EOS. <laughs> the case. <laughs> case. <laughs> um, I can talk about cavitary lung lesion, but a picture is better than a thousand Reza's discussing any clinical problem. And here, really, I think, as Robbie mentioned, what gets prioritized is infection, not any infection, subacute infection based on the tempo that Jack presented and based on the imaging finding and based on the presentation. It's something that's insidious or something that's indolent and malignancy. And now you can use the past medical history, the fact that the patient resided in a a country that's endemic with tuberculosis. Me, myself, I was born in Iran and I actually had a positive PPD. Uh, so I had learned latent tuberculosis and I was on ice, ice for a month, developed liver chemistry test abnormalities, um, was prescribed peridium instead of pyridoxine by accident to prevent peripheral neuropathy from the ice and ice it. When I saw the urine turned orange, I knew something was off and that I had to be on another uh, supplement. But atypical infections like TB, and whenever you say TB, you think about its cousin, histoplasmosis. So you got to think about um, fungi. Um, additionally, the distant, the second cousins is filamentous bacteria like actinomycosis, nocardia. Um, and there are parasites like paragonomyces. Malignancies, you have primary lung cancers, primarily squamous cell but you have multiple lesions here. It's still possible, but you can think about a metastatic process. You can think about lymphoma that's spreading. So all that is to say this, if this is TB, when Jack gets the sputum culture, it should turn positive. It has to like the PCR, the gram saying, because if you have such severe lung disease from tuberculosis, you're gonna be able to isolate something. It's not gonna be one of those cases where everything was negative and then a culture came back positive a month later. It would be very odd for that. So the next step in analysis is to evaluate what's happening in the sputum to see if that gives us an answer. Probably the best way to uh, obtain that is through induced sputum or a bronchial alveolar lavage. Um, if infection is ruled out, then we need to go after tissue. And for that tissue, in addition to evaluating for cancer, we would again assess for atypical infections. Um, and yeah, and, and we should consider parasites as well. Before I give you the mic, Jack, because this is such a pivotal point, let me pass the mic to Robbie to see if he has anything else to layer on that. I will layer nothing but whipped cream because it makes, it just adds calories, but it has no substance. And, and <laughs> A bunch of whipped cream. Wait, are you that. saying my discussion had calories but no substance? No, I'm saying I am <laughs> the whipped cream. <laughs> you can misinterpret anything anything I say. By the way, um, my whipped cream is on my mind because my dog is misbehaving and I'm here, so I can't leave. And the secret, if you're ever doing this, by the way, if you ever have a pet and you need to be somewhere, is always have whipped cream because it'll work like a charm. So I just actually just use some, hence the uh, silly analogy. All right, JP, please, please take the mic away from me. I'm not supposed to be talking. <laughs> All right. Um, so uh, sort of next diagnostic steps was uh, an MRI brain. And that showed um, basically multiple similar cystic lesions of varying sizes. One in the, po in the right posterior fossa, as we saw, there was another in the left temporal lobe, another in the right frontal lobe. They ranged in size from about two centimeters to four centimeters. They were all, they were all cystic with some sort of ring enhancing, but no signs of sort of vasogenic edema or any midline shift. We had a PET scan that showed PET hype, or basically PET avidity in the apical lung lesions, as well as in the mediastinal lymphadenopathy. The cystic brain mets were actually PET negative. So basically photo, photopenic cystic brain lesions. And then in terms of ser like serologic workup that you all had asked for, um, COXI was negative. 
Histourine antigen was negative. AFB smear was negative. And MTV PCR were negative. It's worth noting that there was that the specimens themselves for the sputum and for the induced sputum were limited in terms of the quantity, but for the sputum that was obtained, um, uh, the those those tests were ultimately negative on it. And this will be sort of the last aliquot before I give you all the final diagnosis. Oh, thank you so much, Jack. What an amazing case, and I. I'll leave the cystic brain lesions, and I'm curious if Robbie has a schema that he can share with us for cystic brain lesions, because that is, um, it's just so interesting that when you obtain that CT scan, we had one cyst, then you get better uh, parenchymal analysis with the MRI, and now we have multiple cysts. So what went from one cyst to multiple cysts ends up being an important part of that problem representation. I'll comment on the PET CT scan. And with the PET CT scan, it's just looking for hypermetabolic activity, which can be consistent with both infection and cancer. So the PET CT scan, just like the ESR or CRP, can't pinpoint to what kind of disease entity that you're dealing with. Um, but that's all I have to say. Let me give the mic to Robbie to see how he can incorporate, I think, a pivotal part of this case, being the multiple cysts that are in the brain and then connecting that to the lung. Yeah, no, absolutely. I completely agree. That's a key part of this case. And I think um, I think if you um, if you just approach it as a brain mass and then apply filters that it's cystic, the, you know, the, the, the brain mass is either uh, uh, um, an abscess forming infection or malignancy with some small attention to the three less common possibilities, which is autoimmune diseases like demyelinating diseases that can be tumor factive and vascular lesions can sometimes actually take up a mass like form in the brain. So the focus is, is this an infection or malignancy? And notice we're dropping the autoimmunity here because the autoimmune diseases that tend to cause lung and brain involvement um, don't tend to cause masses. And so um, I think that's the key question is how much, how much radiological input can you, uh, can you glean from the fact that they're cystic? And I actually don't know. I wouldn't be surprised based on how amazing neuroradiologists are and how amazing MRI technology is that in addition to the cystic nature, their enhancement pattern and things of that nature, radiologists can make tremendous inferences. Um, and so the question is how how can we get the most juice out of uh, out of this aliquot with what we know? And um, this goes to show you how clinical reasoning is a function of the person who's doing the reasoning, because a radiologist would extract juice out of this very different than what what um, we can. And for me, this is what I'm trying to do. Um, and the theme for me is um, is again pertinent negatives. We've looked everywhere and have only found a lung and brain problem. And that's key. Because if you tell me that this person has lung, brain, and kidney, I will tell you, hey, TB goes to the kidney as the third most common cause of extrapulmonary disease. And there's almost no such thing as metastatic disease to the kidney. Changes the calculus dramatically. So what is the fact that this disease is isolated to the lung and brain? I already told you why when these, these don't cause masses in the brain. So we're really down to infection and cancer. And um, look at this. I don't want to narrate it. Look at the range of possibilities here. There's so many possibilities. You could have a primary lung cancer that goes to the brain, or you could actually have another cancer that's going both to the lung and brain that you haven't seen on PET-CT because it is a melanoma that's hiding under the axilla, for example. But let's be real here. Reality is we would be making a big mistake if we assumed that there was only one answer here. And let me tell you why. This patient smokes, has a small cell carcinoma, one part, has about 30% of people with small cell carcinoma have some sort of ACTH secretion. This patient has perineoplastic Cushing's and has an immunodeficiency and gets reactivation TB or nocardia. You know how common it is for patients with malignancies to have superimposed infections? It's ridiculously common. So the question isn't so much, what does this patient have? 
it is actually being authentic to the layered approach that has to happen, which is we have to rule out infections. What infections can be restricted to the lung and brain? Nocardia is a classic example. Can't miss nocardia in this patient. Classic patient, structural lung disease, lung and brain syndrome. Well, the script couldn't be any better for nocardia. TB can take up any shape it wants and would be expected to have gone into the neck maybe before it went to the brain. Um, but if you say that there is a, a disease that is strictly limited to the lung and brain, that's when you have to incorporate one key fact. And that key fact for me is, unlike the rest of the body, the lung malignancies have a highway to the brain because they don't filter themselves. Now, what does that mean? When you get cancer elsewhere and it's going to the brain, it's probably going to stop by the liver or the lung before it goes to the brain. And so the fact that we're seeing a restricted lung brain syndrome has me prioritizing a lung cancer, but, but that is a big caveat. There could be a superimposed infection that is in pyogenic. You have a lung cancer, you have a pyogenic lung abscess that goes to the brain, or you have a rare uh, presentation of TB that's restricted to the lung and brain, or you have a common presentation of nocardia. So what's the key step? You need tissue for microbiological analysis and histopathological analysis, and you can't shut the door on the possibility of two diagnoses in, in this patient, in my opinion. Um, and I'll, I'll pass the mic to Prof. Rez for any final reflections before we learn from Jen. A zero. <laughs> I, I think that's... back my whipped cream? Is that what's happening? <laughs> We're using all of our punchlines that, you know, the break in the pasta, the, my love, and the zero. And I just love the way that, um, you see, I think what Robbie just did is just so authentic to the process. Like from aliquot one, we prioritize common causes, like speaking too much. And to this final aliquot, we're saying, look, of course, like everyone wants to get the diagnosis, but there's no way to know what that diagnosis is until we have a tissue specimen. So thank you for doing that, Robbie, and keeping it very authentic to the process. And beautiful schema, by the way. All right. So as you all predicted, tissue ended up being the issue. The patient underwent an, um, basically bronchoscopy with BAL and a endobronchial biopsy of the um, left-sided apical lesion. Essentially, there was no organism seen on the bronchoscopic fluid analysis. The biopsy showed no signs of granulomas, no signs of filamentous organisms, no signs of acid-fast organisms. Um, and the pathology from the biopsy ultimately uh, came back consistent with squamous cell carcinoma of the lung um, with the suspected and, th and what was thought to be the most likely etiology of the brain lesions being basically, um, basically pet, pet negative cystic brain mets from, um, from squamous cell lung cancer. Jack, I, I would love to know um, how the patient did, but just to quickly reflect with you, this just shows you the power of probably probability-based reasoning. Like when we got to that juncture of cavitary lung lesion and we knew the final diagnosis had to explain that, there, when you look at our cancer column, you have squamous cell as the most common malignant cause of cavitary lung lesion. So if you were making an educated guess, for good reasons, based on the frequency, that would be your number one guess. And then you couple that with Robbie's like beautiful explanation of pathophysiology on the connection of lung to brain, because there's no filter, then it becomes even more prior, prioritized, but you stay humble knowing you can never make that guess without tissue. So it just becomes the most likely out of a long list of possibilities. Um, Mike, to you, Robbie. No, I, I couldn't agree. I think that's such a superb analysis. And, and um, I think the, the other side of probability-based reasoning is also, also to recognize when the probability of the diagnosis before the final test is no higher than 50%. And what I mean by that is I, I think it would be incorrect to 
assume that 100 out of 100 of these cases will come back as squamous cell carcinoma. If I had to give you my guess, and there's no data for this, I'd say maybe 70% would, and the other 30% would probably be an infection. So just because it turns out to be the answer in this case doesn't mean it was likely the answer before the final test. Now that's very different when you have somebody who is a young woman who has a male or rash, has AKI, has anti-double-stranded DNA and anti uh, Smith antibody positive. The pretest probability of being, that being lupus is 99%. So you should get there. But in this case, I'd say the pretest probability is no more than 70%. But I'm actually really curious to learn from Jack because often in these cases, you can increase that probability if you have certain under more uh, nuanced understanding. So I don't know, Jack, what you learned in general in this case, and was there a nuanced interpretation to the MRI findings that helped you all be more, the, or the CT findings, or were there any more nuance from the experts that helped you be more confident beforehand? You know, I will say that um, uh, this is a case that, that sort of I like learned about and heard about periphery, sort of like through the ether of cases that come through, but have also um, uh, been like incredibly inspired by it. And so have been bothering a lot of people to help get a, a different or a more refined understanding. I would say like some of the things that I knew from <laughs> calling the radiologist to be like, can you take me through the scan for this patient that I, that I did not care for um, is sort of the understanding that sort of like the cystic lesions, um, I think it, exactly as you all said, like it is, it is a phenotype, but not necessarily a narrowing phenotype by any specific stretch of the imagination in the context of the lung findings. What the neuroradiologist shared with me is like, if we just saw those, it would be a bit of a different DDX, but seeing those cystic findings in the setting of what's happening in the lung, it sort of is the same sort of a, like analogous DDX of the cavitary lung lesion, exactly as both you and Reza said, they sort of where we are in the phase of their development. I think the other thing that was really interesting about this case was sort of like what actually is causing the underlying hoarseness? Like, was it the lymph nodes? Was it the apical lesion? Or was it something at the base of the skull? Um, and I think it probably seems most, most likely because there was sort of no signature of neurologic disease elsewhere that those cystic brain mets were present, but not necessarily causing overt pathology. And that the likely cause of the hoarseness was probably from the, from the, um, from the apical disease. Uh, in the lungs or potentially from the mediastinal lymph nodes. But yeah, I think it, this case really highlighted for me that we sort of go through this process of being like, oh, there's these findings that seem like they're going to be characteristic of a certain disease process that oftentimes leave us with the same DDX of like, is this infection or is this cancer? And I think you can sort of go through all kinds of different phenotypes of those findings. And like this case has two of them, cavitary lesions and cystic brain lesions. And I think it sort of highlights that that DDX doesn't necessarily change, but it really is who the patient is that helps to prioritize it. And I feel like you all covered those points um, really perfectly well. And so I'm not going to take up any, any more time here because I know I've been um, I've been I've been eyeing Deborah's teaching points that she's been writing, and I feel like she has much more to share than I potentially do. But I just want to say thank you all for discussing this, and um, it was super fun to be back in the presenter seat. I enjoyed this. I enjoyed this a lot. Thank you, Jack, for the case. It was a great discussion. I was on fire on teach points, and yeah, I, thank you for Sukiri and Maria for organizing that. I already sent the link for donation for everyone, my parents, my friends, my boyfriend. So let's let's donate. And going for the teaching points, the hoarseness, the, the things that we think first no, normally are the anatomic causes from the brain, the brain stem, the recurrent laryngeal nerve, and the neuromuscular junction. And then we, we start with the red flags that could be dysphagia, odinophagia, weight loss, tobacco, cough, and then go for the most common cause that could be laryngitis or begin vocal cord lesion. And thinking about the laryngitis can be from infection, something that it's a retent a medication or overuse. And the begin vocal cord lesion could be a polypoid corditis, a polyp and a polypoma. Uh, the left recurrent uh, rec region, long curse, the, the left, the left recurrent laryngeal nerve, Normally so for an injury and the cause it's idiopathic, but can be from a tumor dissection. And the thrombocytosis normally can be explained for a reaction to a systemic process or from a primary myeloproliferation disease. Thinking about the cavitary, we thought about infection, malignancy, autoimmune, and other causes. And in the end, the brain and lung syndrome, we thought about TB, nocardia, 
lung cancer and lung abscess. So thank you everyone. Let's go for the next VMR. Deborah, phenomenal job. Thank you so much. Um, excellent teaching as usual. And let's go for the next VMR. I agree, my dear friend. <laughs> we got we got 2361, um, round one. We hope to double and triple that. I just wanted to throw in that the next VMR is in a couple hours. And um, if you want to come for Aaron's wisdom, you totally should. That is like premier feature. But if you want to come and watch me absolutely struggle with scribing to show you how incredible <laughs> CBS offers, that might be an even more hilarious treat. Um, but yeah, I really, really hope to see you there. And thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone. <laughs>